Good afternoon. My name is John Shoesmith. I am the Outreach Librarian here at the Thomas Fisher Rare Book Library, and I hope we're streaming live. Um, I wanted to welcome to our new to our new video podcast series between the, between the pillars. This is a new venture for us, um, especially technologically. So we hope you'll forgive us any sort of technical glitches we might have uh, in this first go around. Um, I promise we'll make any changes to the technical problems we have this time around for our second episode, which will be in in a couple of weeks. So a little bit about this series. We conceived of this idea. Um, Many months ago, just in the early days of our closure during uh, because of COVID-19, um, we wanted we wanted a means to stay connected to our various communities, um, our research community, of course, but also to the general public, to those that come through our revolving door um, each and every day, that come to view our exhibitions, that come to view our open houses, that come to see our lectures. Um, we wanted to make sure that we continue to reach out to those to those important constituencies. But we also thought of it as a means to um, explore some of our collections at the same time, to look at some of the treasures that some of us uh, know well, Margaret Atwood's Handmaid's Tale being one of them, of course, but also some of the lesser known, um, some of the lesser known um, collections, some of the more hidden ones uh, that may not well be as well known, but are no less important in terms of our, what we collect here at the Fisher Library. As well, we also wanted to use this as a means to introduce you to our staff members. So to some of the librarians, the archivists that work here, even the students we hope we're going to have on as well, just to get a sense of who they are, what their passions are, what brought them here to the Fisher Library, and then to also just talk about um, the collections that, that, uh, that are important to them that we have here at, at Fisher Library. So before introducing uh, our participant, um, I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, where we are in terms of um, the Fisher opening. Um, as you know, as of today, uh, most of you know, October 23rd, uh, we, do our, we do remain closed to the general public. Um, however, a few, few weeks ago, we did announce that we were resuming some of our services. We are offering some research and reference services. If you go to our, our main website, fisher.library.utoronto.ca, um, you'll see information about, um, about scanning services that we have at the library. Um, you can also have, a, there's a means to apply to, be, to come to the library to use our resources here within our reading room. Again, information about that is, is, uh, is on our library. So, so while we do remain closed, um, we are doing our best to accommodate a lot of the research needs of our scholarly community. So with that, let's get started. And I'm very happy to introduce the first participant in this series. And I will put him on camera right now. There he is. It's Michael Kassenbaum. Um, Michael's been here now for um, just about a, a little less than a year, I think now. Um, and I think some of you, some of the friends, may have met him at uh, the last, our last public event, which was the um, exhibition opening for Strength in Numbers, our Canlit, our, 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 our exhibition that focused on our Canlit archival collection. And um, and it's interesting that it's a nice segue into what we're going to be talking about today, which is Margaret Atwood and The Handmaid's Tale. Margaret Atwood being our, one of our most important archival collections here at the library. And we wanted to talk a little bit about Michael's connection, personal connection to just some of that material. So just to introduce yourself, Michael, tell us a little bit about yourself. How did you first, how did you, you were telling me just a little bit earlier that um, one of your first introductions to the University of Toronto Libraries was coming to the Fisher Library. Yeah, it's funny. And John, thanks for having me as your first guest. I, I feel, by the way, we're like sitting here in a, in a cathedral. Uh, and I should mention we are socially distanced, in case you're curious. We do have our pillars here right behind us, so we are at a social distance from each other. Uh, but Margaret Elwood uh, in, in The Handmaid's Cell refers in, in one of the chapters, uh, she calls the library is like a temple, and indeed it seems like we're in a temple. Mm. Um, and I first came to this temple, uh, so to speak, um, after a serendipitous meeting uh, with P.J. Carefoot, who's the head of uh, Special Collections. Uh, P.J. and I have uh, similar backgrounds, and he invited me to I think two years ago we had a collection on the Reformation, and so this space that we're sitting in was my very first encounter with the University of uh, Toronto, uh, and my goodness, it is such an extraordinary place. I mean, we have everything from uh, Canada's uh, oldest English language book, the uh, Caxton Cicero, uh, I think printed in mm -hmm. 1481, yeah. uh, to things as contemporary as uh, Margaret Atwood's and Handmaid's Tale, which I'm, I'm, I'm very excited to tell you about. So tell us a little bit about you know, your personal connection with, with The Handmaid's Tale. You're from South Carolina, is that right? I am. I'm from Greenville, South Carolina. I, I don't think I, I still have my accent. I don't know. Maybe <laughs> you can tell me if I, I think, I think it's pretty much been shed uh, by this point. 
Um, but I'm from Greenville, South Carolina. We, we sometimes call Greenville the buckle or the Bible Belt. Right. And uh, grew up in Greenville in the 1980s. I think uh, The Handmaid's Tale was published in 1985. And, you know, Growing up in South Carolina in the 1980s and 90s was really not easy for a gay kid. Um, not only did I feel different uh, from the other boys, but I, I, I also felt like, uh, from a religious perspective, uh, from what I had heard in, in church, um, that, you know, that I was somehow defective. Um, mm. And a lot of my time growing up was spent hiding my true self. Um, a lot of energy was spent putting up masks, and and there was a lot of fear and a lot of anxiety about, about being found out and about being ostracized uh, from the community because of that. And it is a very, very, very religious community. I mean, one of the first questions uh, that they ask you if, if, if you meet someone uh, down there is, you know, what, what church do you go to? Right. And there are probably several to choose from in that area. Many, yeah, <laughs> many, just you know, many on one street. I mean, it's and it's great. I mean, there, there's there's a, a, a wonderful spirit oftentimes among people. But you know, for some who don't necessarily fit in, um, it, it can be hard. Right. Yeah. And reading Margaret Atwood's uh, *The Handmaid's Tale*, I really resonated with uh, this sense of. Know, hiding one's true self. I, I, I really resonated with some of uh, the themes and the tropes that we find uh, in which groups are excluded. Of course, I mean, they're excluded to, to, to extremes, right. in many cases, to death when they don't fit in. Um, but Margaret Atwood, you know, wrote The Handmaid's Tale in part because of concerns that she saw in the 1980s with the rise of uh, the religious right, which right. was itself a reaction to the counterculture movement in the 60s and 70s. Uh, this idea that a lot of these religious leaders were throwing about during that time of taking America back. Right. And uh, oftentimes uh, these leaders set in their sights as a bullseye uh, feminists and, uh, and gay people. Right. One, and one of the things that Atwood really focused in on, and I think that she became very much aware just after publication, was that she would be questioned on certain things. She would be questioned, well, this can't really happen. And I think when we look at some of the research files, which I'll show you right now, which I'll bring up on our, um, on our document camera, right here. Mar the Margaret Atwood Archives, first of all, is an election, excellent collection of material. Um, been collecting Margaret Atwood since the 1970s, early 1970s, and she's an extremely generous donor with us. She donates her materials every year. The Atwood material, the material related to the Handmaid's Tale is really quite amazing and quite special. Um, turn this camera, there we go. So what she, what she did over many, many years, um, prior to the writing the book, during the writing of the book, and then post publication was keep an extensive collection of research materials just so she can point to them and, s and when people said well that can happen she, she can say well actually it does happen and some of these some of these files are are, um, are pretty remarkable in terms of what she's captured um, here's one Michael that, that, that's kind of similar you know women sacrifice career plans for family staff and says um, what, what did you what did you discover the handmaid's tale then so I actually, I have to confess, I discovered The Handmaid's Tale through the Hulu series at first. Right. Um, and then I decided uh, that obviously that I needed to read the book. Um, and I really just, I, I, I fell in love with uh, her prophetic, profound prophetic ability. And I don't know if she'd want to be called a prophet or not. I, I know she wasn't really trying to necessarily um, foresee the future because she is talking about things that um, were happening or things that have happened, as you said, mm -hmm. that she never would include something in her writing that has not somewhere happened in the world. Mm -hmm. um, but in many ways, some of these things have come true. I, in, in one of these uh, art, uh, one of these articles, for example, uh, there's an article about uh, a, a, a kind of a cult-like group w within the Catholic Church yeah. called the People of uh, the People of Hope. Um, I had it here somewhere. Yeah. And it's about this uh, kind of a charismatic group that started in the 1970s, right. and many of their women leaders, uh, in as much as the women were permitted to be leaders, were referred to as 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 handmaids. Yeah, 
Um, of course, we know that's a really kind of contemporary this issue. Is right here. Yeah, right here. So um, here he points out exactly. Yeah, this is this is where it is. So the people of hope called handmaidens, and I don't know. Obviously, we we know what's happening on Monday. There is a uh, a Senate hearing uh, to <laughs> confirm the next. Uh, Supreme Court Justice, uh, this, I'm not sure, was the same group um, that, that Judge Barrett was part of. Um, I think her, her group was called People of People of Hope. I think this group is called People of Praise. Right. Uh, but they are, uh, there were similar groups that, that, that began during the Charismatic Group in the 1970s. And of course, we know that um, Judge Barrett, is, as, as recently as 2010, was referred to as a handmaid within right. The church. I understand they probably did a little new branding when the Hulu series came out. Um, but, but one thing we were talking about earlier, maybe we'll put us back on camera for a minute to talk about it a little bit more. One of the things we were talking about earlier was even though the, the book itself, the themes resonate around a very religious fundamentalist society, I don't think Atwood herself is sort of poking too closely at, at, at people of faith. No, I don't think so at all. I mean, we, we were we were discussing uh, this, in fact, and we see actually the Quakers are uh, predominant uh, throughout uh, the Handmaid's Tale as uh, sort of couriers on the Underground Railroad, so to right. speak, that were helping uh, people escape from Gilead, which was the theocratic regime that uh, over to toppled over the uh, United States government. Uh, also, we see people hanging from this wall, this wall of, of shame from which the dissenters of, of Gilead are, uh, are hanged uh, as, as cautionary tales to everyone else. Mm. And among them are Catholic priests uh, in cassocks. Uh, right. By the way, I think I should probably mention um, that I was also a Catholic priest okay. uh, for some time. <laughs> and uh, one of the themes that we see in The Handmaid's Tale is the women who feel uh, often who are treated like animals and most often treated even worse uh, in this in this novel um, some of them unfortunately also become complicit in upholding uh, the regime right so to speak uh, and, and they do so not not just out of a sense of weakness but just out of a sense of survival mode right that really resonated with me too because as someone who was different as someone who did fear his own sexuality coming out and being known uh, and the consequences thereof. Uh, one of my survival mechanisms was uh, to actually become to become a priest. Right. Uh, and 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 I went to seminary uh, when I was very young, and actually I went to seminary at the Vatican. Right. And wow. <laughs> ended up, uh, in some ways, becoming uh, complicit, I guess, with the same kind of institutional structure which you know, excluded women from any kind of meaningful right. leadership or made um, disparaging or, or, or demeaning regard for gay relationships uh, until I, I guess until I saw the light um, and until I, I, I finally had the, the courage to um, to be authentic right uh, and I felt like I could finally breathe right I think I was really struck when I was reading The Handmaid's Tale um, of the language that we see uh, in the very beginning, especially describing the atmosphere and the environment, right. uh, it's difficult to breathe almost when we talk, when we hear Alfred uh, narrate. Uh, right. it, it's the air is stagnating. She feels like it's suffocating. The air is the air is stale. And for so much of my life, I felt that way. I felt like I couldn't breathe. I felt like I couldn't be myself. And finally, when I finally came out, and when I was finally uh, comfortable with being who I am right. and authentic, I finally felt like I was able to breathe. Right. And what's so ironic about that is, you know, I thought, I feared that 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 by leaving um, this kind of institutional place of ministry and, and, and the church in an institutional sense that I would I would not have a have a relationship with God. In fact I, I felt myself becoming even more spiritual. Right. And it's not for accident that, you know, the word spirituality and the word spirit or breath respiration 
are etymologically similar. Right. Um, when I was finally authentic, when I finally felt like I could be who I am, uh, I felt I felt free to breathe and I felt free to feel the spirit. And uh, and I'm just so grateful to be in a place too where I can kind of continue those those good impulses that did lead me to the priesthood right. because I was concerned about helping people or the existential uh, you know questions of the day. But being in a place like the libraries where I feel safe to explore questions. Which I want to follow through on in a minute, but I put, I just as Michael was talking there, I put on um, on the screen the very first draft of The Handmaid's Tale, which um, if you look from the very first, oops, look from the very first, a lot of people who have seen the Hulu uh, program will recognize, of course, the very first lines from the, uh, that, that offer narrates in the, uh, on the show. A chair, a table, a lamp, a window, two white curtains. This is the very first draft of The Handmaid's Tale. As you can see, she handwrites all of the uh, all of her drafts, her first drafts. Um, a little bit of a uh, not the easiest uh, uh, handwriting to decipher, as someone that's archived some of this material in the past, it can be a little challenging. But for a lot of people, this is very very stirring material to look at because, as I said, it uh, gets us a little one one step closer to the uh, to the act of creation, one step closer to to Margaret Atwood herself. Let's talk a little bit about libraries, and especially how Atwood treats libraries in um, in the Handmaid's Tale. Yeah. So, as I was reading, um, rereading the Handmaid's Tale, I, I I noticed all of the references to uh, first of all to the burning of books, right. um, as we see the uh, the U.S. government being overthrown by this uh, Gileadian regime. Uh, of course, we see that in all kinds of autocracies and dictatorships through history, the, the destruction of books. Uh, right. And what's interesting is that there is a scene in the book where uh, a new law is passed and women can no longer legally hold jobs. Right. So the boss comes into the workplace and says, ladies, I have to let you all go. What's interesting to see, though, is that she offered, before she was offered June, is working in the library, right? And she is in the process of transferring books to discs. Right. I guess they had CD-ROMs back in uh, <laughs> back in the mid '80s. She's in. She's basically digitizing these books for for preservation, and it's just interesting to see her kind of um, as the antithesis of what the regime is doing. The regime is destroying literature. Right. The regime is destroying information in books and she is in the act of, of, of preserving that right. to make the future to make them accessible to the future. And you know, it just got me thinking about the roles of libraries in general. Um, when we see uh, troubling things on the horizon sometimes, when we see uh, attempts at autocracy or attempts at uh, misinformation or disinformation campaigns. Right. Um, as we see attempts to restrain people from access, accessing information, uh, how important libraries are. Right. How important libraries are in preserving information, preserving data as collective uh, human memory, uh, but also of making it accessible for the future. future Do you have that passage? Because I mean, I, th I think I brought, I brought it up here. Um, in this, this is the this is the first typewritten draft yeah. of The Handmaid's Tale. Let's so so focus right. that in a bit more. It's right here. So. This is actually how I how I read the book on this, but uh, I'll, I'll I'll read the. So this is from chapter twenty eight, um, and this is uh, this is Alfred, the protagonist, speaking before she's. Uh, she said, "I worked transferring books to computer disks to cut down on storage space and replacement costs." They said, "Diskers," we called ourselves. We called the library a discotheque, which was a joke of ours. After the books were transferred, they were supposed to go to the shredder, but sometimes I took them home with me. I like the feel of them, and the look. Luke said I had the mind of an antiquary. He liked that. He liked old things himself. Hmm. Interesting. So it's uh, it's pretty amazing to see. I mean, uh, obviously, I, I, I downloaded a uh, version of this book. It's 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 <laughs> it's incredible to yes. see the first edition of this, which she actually. Uh, and then her handwriting, where, where, where she edited. I, I, I mean, it, I feel so privileged to be able to, um, 
to see this. Right. So that, that brings us to the end of this, uh, this uh, first podcast series of uh, between the, our first episode of Between the Pillars. I want to thank Michael. Um, so we have a few, we're doing this every second Friday. Um, next up will be our science and librarian, uh, science and medicine librarian, Alexander Carter, who will be talking about collecting science and medicine books. Um, you can see the entire list of upcoming folks on, um, on the website as well, so please check that out. Um, there'll be a playlist as well here on YouTube that you get to see all of the, you can, you can tell people about all the subsequent, uh, all the, the, next, the upcoming episodes and, and, and watch the ones that we've already done. So I do hope you join us. Um, I hope the technical problems um, weren't, too, uh, weren't too onerous and we look forward to seeing you in a couple of weeks.